Hello, and welcome to POMA Does, a podcast produced by the Pennsylvania Osteopathic Medical Association. We provide a voice for osteopathic medicine and share insights on issues important to osteopathic physicians, residents, and students, as well as those who embrace the osteopathic philosophy. POMA's mission is to promote the distinctive philosophy and practice of osteopathic medicine for our patients, our members, and the communities we serve. Thanks for tuning in. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of the POMA Does podcast series, sponsored by the Pennsylvania Osteopathic Medical Association. I'm Lisa Witherite Rigdio, POMA's immediate past president and champion of our education pillar. The POMA Foundation is the exclusive physician partner for the PIAA. In support of that collaboration, POMA is producing today's podcast, highlighting the significance of concussions in our student athletes. This is our third podcast episode that is eligible for CME credits. To claim your AOA Category 1B credit, visit the webpage noted in this episode's description or visit the POMA Does podcast page on the POMA website. This podcast episode was developed entirely by POMA. None of the panelists or planners for this episode have any conflicts of interest to disclose. I'll now turn things over to Dr. Katherine Graham to moderate a discussion with sports medicine fellow, Dr. Kaylin Strasser Curtis. I am Dr. Katie Graham coming to you live with Dr. Kaylin Strasser Curtis, and we are going to talk to you about concussions. It's exciting because this podcast is available for CME to claim credits. Visit the webpage uh, noted in the episode's description or visit the POMA Does podcast page on the POMA website. We can get you set up for that. I am very excited about this episode. Dr. Strasser Curtis was one of my former residents. Tell us now what you're doing. Doc. Yeah, so nice to be here with you, Dr. Graham. I'm now completing my sports medicine fellowship at Penn Highlands, so kind of more into the genre of athletes, but also older patients as well that just want to stay active. So family medicine was fun, but sports medicine's even more fun. <laughs> <laughs> so yesterday was Friday Night Lights in the region, and then obviously there's football on today and tomorrow. So tell us what the big thing is that you guys have been focusing on. Yeah, so right now, can Concussion is really important. I mean, it's really important no matter what athletic season you're in. But I know in the fall, you think of the fall sport, like you said, Friday Night Lights. Everybody thinks of football, a very big contact sport. And there's a reason they wear helmets for that sport. So concussions are certainly very prevalent in the football world. Some of the big statistics we have for sports related concussions specifically is there's typically between 1.7 and 3 million sports related concussions a year. And 300,000 of those come from football alone. And that's not to say you can't sustain one during a volleyball, soccer. I've seen them across all sports, but football is definitely the number one sport that you can receive a concussion in. And the biggest thing with athletes is a recent study showed us that most high school and even collegiate football players and athletes specifically, they withhold information because they don't know what a concussion is. They don't understand their symptoms. They don't want to be held out of play, but also they don't understand what's happening. So in football, you get tackled a couple of times and you get a headache. Okay, that's fine. But then when your symptoms continue, they don't understand that's likely related to a concussion. So they don't mention anything or they say, hey, I kind of have a headache, but coaches or different staff brush them off because, hey, it's a contact sport. You're going to have a little bit of a headache from time to time. And the next thing you know, we have second impacts in your waves and prolonged recovery. So this is certainly a topic that we should all be aware of and be able to recognize because once you have one concussion, there's a risk of two to six times higher that you will receive a second concussion. So it's a very important topic and I'm glad we're talking about it today. Oh, geez. In light of recent injuries and everything that's going on, can you define a traumatic brain injury and how is that different, I guess, from a concussion? Yeah, absolutely. So traumatic brain injury, that's a traumatically induced transient disturbance of the brain function. And that involves a very complex pathophysical logic. We don't really quite fully understand and could take hours to just talk about that alone. But that TBI or traumatic brain injury is kind of the umbrella term that we use. Concussion, that's on the mild end of traumatic brain injury. So that's caused by a direct blow to either the head, the neck, the body that causes an impulsive force that's transmitted to the brain that usually occurs during sports or exercise related activities. That blow can then initiate a neurotransmitter and metabolic cascade that can cause possible axonal injury blood flow changes, autonomic dysfunction, and sometimes inflammation and swelling to the brain. Typical concussion symptoms, they usually start immediately or at least within up 
to the first 72 hours. After that, you got to kind of start thinking of other things going on. And they most commonly resolve on their own in about seven to 10 days. Sometimes you need some medicine or some physical therapy to help kind of move that along. But it's usually 72 hours after a hit, you start to get the symptoms and then they go away in seven to 10 days. But clinical signs and symptoms of concussion, most notably, you can't explain them away by something else. So they can't be explained by drugs, alcohol, medicine use, or any other injuries. So it's really the broad umbrella when we say TBI. And then we talk about concussion because there's so many signs and symptoms that you really have to tease out what's going on, which is why it's good if you suspect an athlete has a concussion that they're evaluated by a trained medical professional in concussion to help kind of tease out what's going on. So from what I understand, is it correct to say that TBI is kind of like a spectrum in the concussion part? Is it the very end of it or the more mild end? Absolutely, yes. And are there different grades of concussions or is it just like a one size fits all? So there's not necessarily different grades, but it's also not really one size fits all. Each concussion is different. So if you sustain a concussion, yours would be different than mine versus if an elderly person was playing tennis at the Y, theirs might be different. So there's not really grades for concussions, but no two concussions look the same. So there's some that you have a mild concussion, you may only have symptoms for a couple of days, then you have severe concussions that involve loss of consciousness, prolonged recovery time. So again, there's not really a grading system, but there is definitely mild to severe. So I guess kind of, sort of, maybe. No, because the symptoms can kind of present, you know, immediately versus over hours. Is it harder to diagnose? It can be, especially if you're not trained in concussion. I know a lot of PCPs are kind of the front line with concussions. Parents call their pediatrician, their primary care doctor, and they're like, hey, my kid has sustained a head injury. They're now having headaches. What do we do? They see them. But if you're in the middle of cold or flu season and you also kind of have a cold, well, colds typically come with sinus symptoms. So you can have a sinus headache and it's hard to differentiate. Okay, well, is it their sinus headache and their cold that's causing them a headache or is it the hit they sustained Friday night? That's where it's important to see somebody that's trained in concussion and can kind of use the different testing and tools that we have to tease out the symptoms and signs and make sure that, yes, this is a concussion, we're treating you appropriately, or no, you just maybe have a sinus infection that's kind of compounding everything that we're looking at. So it's really important to have somebody on the sideline to kind of help make that diagnosis. Absolutely. I mean, coaches, parents, and teammates are important because they can tell you, hey, this athletes not acting the way they usually do. They're not seeming like themselves, but they're not trained in concussion protocol. So it's really a good idea to have an athletic trainer. And even if you can get a physician on the sideline that has been trained in concussions that can say, hey, they need to sit out or now they're okay. Like they can go back in because early detection is the best thing we can do for these athletes because nobody wants to let a concussion go undiagnosed. And then you potentially get a second hit and then things are a lot worse than they would be if we had caught it earlier. So what does some of that sideline evaluation kind of comprise of? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing we do is usually I don't go to the athlete unless the athletic trainer needs me. They're really the first line. They can tell me if the athlete's acting like themselves, if they are acting a little different, or if I notice a kid gets up from a play and they're really stumbling, having trouble standing up, which we see quite often in the NFL games you'll see the trainers come out and get them right away. So usually you take them over and you do a quick cognitive eval. So I always ask orientation questions like, where are we? When we think of questions like date, time, place that we do like in the hospital setting or even in the office, most athletes aren't going to be able to answer and tell you what month it is, what date it is. They're kids. They don't know. They're not paying attention to that. But if you ask them, what sport are you playing? Who's winning? What quarter is it? Most of the time they can answer those questions. And then we always check balance disturbances. So there's what's called a best evaluation. So that is comprised of the athlete having to hold three different types of stance without error. So we have them stand with their eyes closed, hands on their hips, legs together, then a single leg stance, and then have them do a tandem gait. That's very validated in the world of sports medicine. It's very specific and sensitive for concussion. So if that is abnormal at all, typically I pull the athlete because if you don't have balance, you're not going to be able to protect yourself on the field and you're more likely to get hurt. We also do stuff where we have memory recall. So we'll give them a list of a couple words, talk to them for a few minutes, and then we will ask them to recall that. Some other physicians will do things like serial sevens. So start at 100 and go back by sevens. Most athletes I've tested can't do that when they don't have a concussion. So I don't usually use that. I don't even know if I could do that on a normal day without having to really think about it. And then we also always check their eyes for the vestibular ocular system. So we check for smooth pursuit. I always look for nystagmus, make sure their pupils are 
dilated or there's not one that's different, make sure they're not delayed. Sometimes I'll do a neuro exam depending on what the hit and was and like how they're presenting, what they're complaining of. There's a toolkit that we have and you can pick and choose what you used based on what you think you need. So again, it's kind of variable with sign line evaluation, but it's super important that you have somebody that knows what to look for when they are evaluating. Excellent. And I assume that there's some, you know, kind of follow up, you know, if they get diagnosed with a concussion on the sideline in the office. Absolutely. So if there's any sort of concern for concussion, we always recommend that they follow up at minimal with their PCP or pediatrician, but it's never a bad idea to follow up with someone in sports medicine that's trained in the concussion world. So we get a lot of referrals. Monday mornings are very busy in our office with referrals and requests to evaluate kids for possible concussion. We talk to our athletic trainers frequently. They will text us and let us know, hey, so-and-so had a nasty hit. Like, can we take a look at them? And we are always more than happy to look at them. I'd rather look at a kid and say, no, you're fine, than them not be looked at if something happens. So the main symptom of concussion seems to be headaches. Yes. Anywhere between 85 to 95 percent of kiddos get headaches. The second most common symptom they'll have is dizziness or balance disturbance, which goes back to the vestibular ocular motor system, which is in charge of integrating both balance vision and movement. So yeah, between headaches and blurriness and double vision, those are the big three that we usually see. And then along with the cognitive issues. So a lot of kids complain about having to look at the screens at school because there's a lot more computer work than there used to be. But headache is the number one thing we see for most patients. What determines when you see a referral on Monday morning as to whether or not the patient is going to need a scan or further testing? Yeah, so that's always the big question, especially given kind of everything that has been happening this football season. The big question, I've been getting to par- from parents is, do we scan them? Do they need a CT scan? And we're I like, what do we need to do? So you cannot see a concussion on any sort of imaging, no CT scan or MRI, unless it's a functional MRI, which there's still debate on whether that's even helpful in diagnosing a concussion or a clinical diagnosis. You take a thorough history, you do your physical exam, and you say, hey, this is what I think is going on. But there are risk factors that certainly would warrant a scan. So if they have prolonged loss of consciousness, they have any focal neuro deficits, they have a visible deformity to their skull. If they felt unprotected, so if we think of an athlete and they get tackled, they go down, they get up on their own. But if they then get up on their own and completely collapse and they don't try and catch themselves, that is something that's very concerning and that would warrant an ER evaluation and a scan. If they have asymmetric pupils, I'd be worried about a brain bleed or a declining GCS or worsening ultramental status as we keep checking on them on the sideline. They have an impact seizure. So if they get hit and go down and start to have seizure-like activity, that's very concerning. Or if they have persistent vomiting, that would be concerning for brain swelling. So the CDC doesn't recommend routine imaging, especially in pediatric patients because of the high dose of radiation. But if they have the aforementioned issues we just talked about, then that could warrant imaging to see if there's anything else going on. Biggest thing you'd be worried about is a brain bleed. What kind of determines whether or not you get a CT or an MRI? So CTs, we know if someone comes in, they have altered mental status and you're worried about a brain bleed, we get a CT without contrast. So that's just the first thing we pull for. But if it's outside the window of what we would potentially see on a CT scan, say someone comes in weeks later saying, hey, I got a concussion a few weeks ago and I'm still not feeling right and they're worried, maybe then you pursue an MRI and see if there's any long-lasting effects. I like to think of it kind of like strokes. If you have something acute, you're going to see a bleed, but if it's something that's prolonged, you need different imaging to look at the brain and see if there's any long-lasting impacts. Hypothetically, if you're diagnosed with a concussion, what's the best way to treat it? So the best way to treat a concussion is what we call relative rest for the first 48, 72 hours. So you just do your activities of daily living, get up, eat, relax, shower, that kind of stuff, but no real increase in your heart rate for aerobic activity. Sometimes you can use medicine to help with headaches, any neck pain you're having. The first couple of days, you want to stay away from any anti-inflammatory. So I always pull for Tylenol just in case there is any sort of bleeding. You don't want to make it worse. But then after that, you can start to use NSAIDs. I like to tell patients for any neck pain to use a heating pad. But yeah, the biggest thing is relative rest. Rest your brain, especially for kiddos. I always tell them no video games. Try and stay off your cell phone, which in today's day and age is impossible. They laugh at me when I tell them. that. But then there is studies that show after about 48, 72 hours, which is the typical time frame that you should have most of your concussion symptoms you're going to get. 
it's a good thing to actually get up and start having light aerobic activity. So nothing that is above the threshold of your symptoms. So as long as it's not causing you to have symptoms, it's okay to get up and walk around and start to do things. But if you're doing something that's causing symptoms, then you should back off. But the biggest thing is relative rest and just giving the brain a chance to heal. Is there any role for OMM? Absolutely. Yeah. We have a lot of patients that come in with neck pain, especially football players, because if you think about it, they're being tackled. There's more than likely going to be some cervical strain or a little bit of a whiplash injury with that. So OMM is one of the things that it's non-invasive and honestly probably is going to feel really good for them, especially myofascial release and stretching. And we've even recommended that. I know our residents here at Penn Highlands have an OMM clinic and we've said, you know, if that's something you want to try, we can always try and get you over there with them. We recommend chiropractic care, physical therapy for neck pain. But yeah, OMM is something that's super easy to do in the office. And if you have someone that's trained in that and they have time within their visit, it's something you can do right then and there to start giving them relief. Is there anything that family members can do to help kind of expedite recovery? Absolutely. So the biggest thing for family members and what I educate parents and guardians on is talk to your kids. Let them know that they need to be honest about their symptoms and that we're not trying to keep them out just for the fun of keeping them out. We want them to be safe. But they also can watch out for signs and symptoms because the old adage used to be that you can't sleep for 24 hours after you hit your head. So everybody has to stay up. You can't sleep. You can't rest. That's not the research anymore. So the research now is let them sleep, let them have brain rest. You don't have to wake them. But if you go to wake them and you have trouble waking them, that's concerning. Or if they have excessive sleepiness or they're not sleeping at all, that's stuff that the kiddo may be like, eh, I'm just extra sleepy. That's fine. But the parents know that's not their normal. They also can let me know who hey, their personality is completely different. Like in the office, I see a lot of kiddos that they don't talk. They don't want to make eye contact. So I ask, is that their normal? Because sometimes kids are shy. And usually the parents are like, no, this is not them at all. So then they can say, hey, their personality is back to normal. I know they're starting to feel better. But they also can want for the uncontrolled vomiting, any neurological deficits. I usually kind of coach parents on what to look for those because if you're not in healthcare, you don't really know what you're looking for. They're my second line of defense because the athlete is my first line. They tell me what they're feeling, but then the parents back that up. I've had kids say, oh, I feel fine. And the parents are like, no, you're not fine. You were throwing up just last night. Like, don't lie. So they're definitely a big part of concussion return to play for concussion. All right. And is there any, you know, risk to kind of premature return? Oh, absolutely. So premature return to play increases your risk for decreased reaction. So like I said, if I send someone back out in the field and they have balance issues or concerns for a concussion, they can't protect themselves. They're at a greater risk of getting hurt, whether it's another hit to the head or it's something else. So we always like to tell kiddos that we don't even start return to play until you're at least 24 to 48 hours free of symptoms without any sort of medication or help to decrease your symptoms. Most of them don't like that because then they know that their return to play is at least five days long. So they're like, but doc, I just want to keep going. And I get that. Trust me, I was a high school athlete at one point too. And that's all you want to do in high school is play sport. But at the same time, I always tell my kiddos, you only get one brain. So we have to keep that protected. And I don't want to run into you in 30 years and you have all these prolonged issues because we didn't treat you right the first time. So just because I'm from Pittsburgh and everybody thinks about Sidney Crosby and how he was out forever with the concussion, can you talk a little bit about a prolonged recovery? Yeah, absolutely. So prolonged recovery, we classify that as any symptoms persisting greater than four weeks across all age groups. So you can have prolonged headaches, migraines, cognitive difficulties, dizziness, balance problems, and that can help further delineate kind of what part of the concussion is it resolving, any referrals we might need to make. Prolonged recovery can happen the more concussions you have and the more severe your impact was. Depending on your hit, if you have loss of consciousness, that concussion is going to be much worse. And if you don't, and the kids in football always like to tell me, oh, I just got a little dinged up. Well, okay, maybe you have a mild concussion versus severe. But the more concussions you have, which Cindy Crosby's had uh, several, It seems like every time he has one, the longer his recovery is. That's because it compounds. Every time you have another concussion, it's going to take longer to recover. Your brain's getting more damaged or hurt, and then your systems have to kind of rewire themselves. What are the long-term consequences of untreated concussions? So untreated concussions can cause long-term memory issues. There's research that has shown that in retired 
professional football players, they have an increased risk for dementia and neurological disorders such as Alzheimer's disease. You can have migraines that you didn't have before. You can have headaches you didn't have before. Depression, especially again, professional sports. So you have a three or more concussions, then you can have an increase for dementia later in life. There's also second impact syndrome, which is very rare, but it is often fatal. So that's when an athlete's not recovered from a concussion completely and they receive a blow to the head. That causes cerebral edema, which causes an increase in your intracranial pressure, as we know, and then that can cause herniation. And those athletes rapidly decline. Those are the athletes you see, they get hit and they just, they don't get up and you go out and they're unconscious or they're having a seizure and you just know something's not right. So long-term consequences of concussion is not something I would personally ever want to deal with. So I was trying to let my kids know that it's not worth it because high school sports and even college sports will eventually end and you want to be able to do the other things in life. So is there any time or thought as to when you would disqualify a patient from continuing a sport because of this? That's always a good question. And there's no evidence-based guideline as to, okay, after three concussions, we need to have this conversation or after four, you're done completely. It's always athlete specific. We always sit down and we say, hey, this is your third concussion and you're maybe a sophomore in high school. Maybe it's time to think about a different sport or we just always have that conversation. But usually... I think most docs after two start to be like, hey, you've had two now, let's kind of think, should we start doing something different? But certainly after four or five, I would really push that the athlete be done just because, again, the more you have, the worse they are every time. And then those prolonged effects are more than likely going to come back and rear their ugly head once you're in your 30s or 40s. So we talked about a lot of things, but just to kind of wrap things up, what do you think the big take home points are? So the big take-home points, early detection is key. So if you're at a football game and you're a coach, you're a parent, even someone sitting in the stands and you notice a kiddo kind of look like they got up from a play rough and they're stumbling and they're not kind of getting the attention that they maybe should, it's never a bad thing to like say, hey, that kiddo doesn't look right. Or if it is your own kid, you're going to know that their personality and stuff's not right. So definitely get them checked out. I'd rather patients or parents get their kiddos checked out and we say, hey, there's nothing wrong, then there'd be something that we miss and something goes wrong. But also for the kids, if anyone watches this with their kids, it's okay to tell us what your symptoms are. Don't mask your symptoms because I don't want the second impact syndrome for you. I don't want the prolonged recovery time. So the biggest thing, early detection is key. And then just don't lie about your symptoms. Excellent. Well, I don't think I have any additional questions. Is there anything that, you know, I kind of haven't asked that you'd like to emphasize? I think the probably the one other thing I want to make sure that everybody knows is that undiagnosed and untreated concussions, especially sports related concussions, they have long lasting lifetime health implications. So it's important for everyone to know the signs and symptoms of concussions. It helps our players stay in the game, but it also keeps them healthy. So if there's any time you have questions and you're around a healthcare worker that is versed in concussion, ask the questions. There's no dumb question. Ask all the questions. Do the research. Anything we can do to keep our athletes safe from parents, coaches, teammates, officials to even the sideline healthcare workers is going to be beneficial. There's nothing that we're going to learn that's not going to be helpful. I think that's the only other thing I really wanted to make sure that everybody is aware of. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time today. And hopefully you can enjoy what at least watching some football. And I hope you have a great weekend. Thanks, Dr. Graham. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Palma Does. Be sure to subscribe to Palma Does wherever you listen to your podcasts and tell your friends and colleagues to tune in. Learn more about osteopathic medicine and Palma on our webpage, www.palma.org, and join the conversation on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. Or email us at palma at palma.org. We'd love to hear from you. Join us next time for another edition of Palma Dust.